All right. Hey, runners, have you been struggling with fueling your body properly for a half marathon? Do your legs feel maybe heavy, sluggish, or you hit the wall or you like bonk during your last half marathon? Are you wondering what nutrition is needed for half marathon training? Welcome to episode 220 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. Today, I have with me the amazing Brooke Zarnecki, registered dietitian, nutritionist, um, host of the Actively Fueled podcast, and our resident uh, registered dietitian on our Spark Healthy Runner team, who's going to share her half marathon nutrition tips for success. Brooke, thank you so much for coming back on the show to share all of your knowledge on this topic that I know you are very passionate about. Of course, Dwayne. I can't wait to jump into it and be back again. I feel you said episode 220. We'll have to look back and see like what episode I first appeared on, but I'm pretty sure it was maybe before you even hit 100. So that's pretty cool that we're already that we're here again at 220. It was definitely before we hit 100 because I actually looked back and you've actually been on seven episodes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is number eight. So yeah, you're, you're a staple on the podcast (laughs) here. Um, so if you don't mind, if someone didn't listen to those other seven episodes and they're new to the podcast, can you tell the listeners, you know, what you do and, um, where you're from, who you are, all that fun stuff. Yeah. So I'm a registered dietitian, as Dwayne mentioned, and gosh, uh, kind of jumping all over the place on the map in terms of location, but my family is now in Kentucky. Um, we're a military family, so we're all over the place. Uh, Kentucky is great so far. It's warmer than Alaska, which is where we were previously. Um, and I help runners with their sports nutrition. So any anybody who's training for a race, I also help individuals who are recovering from eating disorders and disordered eating improve their relationship with food. Um, and sometimes I do both, like a combination of training for a race and improving your relationship with food. So I absolutely love what I do. And I, like you said, I just could talk about it all day. So I'm really stoked to talk about the half marathon today and get you guys well fueled for your next one. Or maybe you're well, you forgot to leave out because I think the last time you had dropped it that you were about to go on maternity leave. Yes, so I did. So you're a new that. mommy as well now. <laughs> yes, uh, it's almost seven months. So seven months postpartum. Um, and even just like my own running journey has been so unique coming back from having a baby. Um, learned so much about myself, not only as a mother, but an entrepreneur, as a person. So it has been such a journey. And I'm sure that any uh, moms listening out there just totally get it, um, how we all have our own unique unique paths. But I'm sure you know things will be sprinkled in here or there throughout our episode too, because being a mom is definitely one of my favorite parts of me now. So it's, it's great. Yeah, no, it's definitely one of those life-changing moments, right? Like those moments that you're never going to forget. Like I remember when I became a dad and daughter was born, like your life and just your perspective on everything just changes right and like you are responsible for like this other human right (laughs) um so guys um today's episode actually like we're going to get into all the details of half marathon nutrition um during training during the race itself but um This episode also comes with a freebie download, which is our nutrition blueprint. So Brooke has actually created this amazing resource for you on what you should eat as a runner. And this blueprint really lays out um, like fueling as a runner so you're not feeling sluggish during your runs. Um, And what's included in this download is top five nutrition tips for runners, nutrition basics for running. The ultimate snack guide, which is super helpful. Everyone loves that. And then some long run fueling strategies. And the best part, it's all free, guys. So you can get it as a PDF download, save it for future reference, print it out. I will drop the link in the show notes below. But if you just go to learn.sparkhealthyrunner.com forward slash nutrition, you can download that uh, freebie. And if you're a runner who's looking for individualized nutrition plan and want to prevent under fueling so you can run that half marathon without hitting the wall, 
then you can actually get guidance from Brooke within our one-on-one signature healthy runner coaching program. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, if for those of you who have listened to episode 211 on the Healthy Runner podcast, then you heard one of the many clients that Brooke and I have collaborated with in combining injury recovery, strength training for running, run coaching, and Brooke's nutrition expertise. And Rachel in that episode shared her story of how she went from being like an underfueled and injured runner to conquering her first marathon. Um, and she got the guidance from Brooke and myself. And if you missed that one, go back, have a listen, episode 211, uh, to hear Rachel's inspirational story. And as um, most of you certainly know by now that there are six parts of your running journey that need to be optimized so you can run strong and last long. And if you don't know what those parts are, they are mindset, strength training, run plan, nutrition, recovery, and race strategy. And when we execute all six of these key parts of our running journey, then we will feel um, more confident. And we're going to get stronger and even get faster along the way. And most importantly, we'll stay healthy and enjoy the process of running again and crush some half marathons along the way. So therefore, in today's episode, you are going to get your nutrition bucket filled with a bunch of goodies and tips from Brooke that you can implement into your half marathon training and your race day strategy. So Brooke, yeah, let's start with the training first, right? Because most people sign up for half marathon, then they're like, oh, shoot. Now I'm technically half marathon training where they download a plan off the internet and it's like half marathon training plan. Okay. Week one, here I go. Um, you know, what nutrition is really needed for half marathon training? Yeah. So we're going to start like way back at the basics before we even talk about like the nitty gritty of specifically running nutrition. Um, when you are moving your body consistently, you also need to be feeding your body consistently. So if you are somebody that, um, maybe has struggled with consistency in eating, which gosh, many of us do myself included again, as a postpartum mom, like I've had to revamp everything. Um, take a look at what you're currently doing, like baseline level, take an assessment. What, what does my day-to-day feeling look like? Am I skipping meals? Am I, you know, skipping snacks? Do I wait six hours to eat my, before I eat my first meal in the morning? We really want to go back to the basics and make sure that we are eating at very least three meals per day. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you've got that nailed down, we've got to maybe think about incorporating some snacks in there in between. So eating consistently is always, always, always the first point that we want to be looking at and focusing on. And you would be so surprised how just that one simple little thing can make such a big difference. Um, And it's because life just gets so busy. We don't even realize that we've gone five plus hours without eating. My golden rule is try not to go more than three to four hours without eating. Um, When you wake up, make sure you're eating something within the hour. And then after that, make sure that you're going you know, every three to four hours, don't go longer than three to four hours without eating, have those meals, have a couple snacks in there so that you're able to not go long periods of time without eating. So rule number one is uh, eating consistently. Um, Love it. So really focusing on the basics, right? And just in general for anyone who is looking to live a healthier lifestyle, right? And even the old misconception of like, okay, I'm just going to like starve myself and maybe I'll lose weight, right? Like that's actually like the reverse, right? In, in what actually happens in our bodies. Um, so the consistent eating is actually important to kind of keep that metabolism going and, and maintain all of our systems essentially, Absolutely. right? And, and the biggest myth that still circulates out there, um, cause it's still talked about out there is that when you run on an empty stomach, you're going to burn fat. So like if you go out and you run fasted or you're working out fasted, um, your body is going to be burning fat. And that's actually not the case, especially with high intensity cardio. What happens when we go out and we fast and we do really high intensity cardio, we actually dip into our muscle stores and not our fat stores. So we need carbohydrates before we go out and run, before we do high intensity cardio, um, so that we are using that as fuel. And the saying goes, fat burns in a carbohydrate flame. So we actually need carbohydrates to then burn the fat stores. That's not the ultimate goal, but just so that you guys understand, you know, the physiology of what happens in our body, fasting when we do high intensity things is actually counterintuitive to our goals and what we want to do as a runner and athlete. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that because yeah, you you see all of that, and I was one of those people who thought that, and so I did that for many many years until we met, and you helped really uh, change my running trajectory. Honestly, these last like three or four years, I don't even know how long it's been. We got to come up with like an anniversary date um, <laughs> when when you came into my life, um, because yeah, the fueling is like so important, and if you think about you know, we talk about this a lot on the podcast of, you know, a lot of runners are lacking strength in certain areas and certain muscles. So it's like counterproductive when you're trying to either maybe like you are implementing some strength training for running, which is amazing, right? We love that. But then if you're not actually like fueling the muscle with nutrition and then the muscles actually being starved, then it's not going to recover. It's not going to rebuild. It's not going to get stronger. Right. So it's like counterproductive um, to what most of our goals are as runners. And you need strong, healthy muscles in order to run any distance or if you your goal is to eventually run faster. Right. Yes, absolutely. So we want to be able to we want to be eating consistently. We want to be feeding our body um, instead of instead of starving it is, is essentially the message here. All right. Any other um suggestions that you can think of when we look at kind of training beyond kind of the basics of how often we're eating throughout the day? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that, that come to mind. Uh, the first one is people will ask me a lot of the time, like, how do I, how do I adjust my nutrition for like increasing mileage? And this usually comes into play when you are training for something like a half marathon because you are doing some of those longer runs. And so we want to be thinking about things like pre-workout fuel, during workout fuel, post-workout fuel. I know that we'll talk about that more in depth as we go on into this podcast episode here. Um, but just thinking about those things. And if you are somebody that really hasn't thought about that before or haven't implemented it before, um, if you are running consistently throughout the week, and let's say your mileage is getting up into like the upper teens, the 20s, the mid 20s, the 30s, the 40s, we really want to be prioritizing these things and making sure that we are giving ourselves something before we head out. Um, anything over 60 minutes, we want to make sure that we are doing some sort of during fuel routine. And then of course, post-workout, whether it's a meal or some sort of beverage just to replenish our muscles and replenish what we lost during training. Um, pre, during, and post-workout fuel is super, super important. And then comes, all right, when I'm like at the peak of my training, my, my mileage is the longest that it's been. We really want to look at our overall intake and make sure that we are optimizing carbohydrate intake. So as mileage increases, our carbohydrate needs increase as an athlete. And I know that that can sound so scary, um, especially with just all the messaging that we hear about carbohydrates and they're quote unquote bad and we need to stay away from them. Runners need these things to help them propel their, their training, prevent injury, and just feel really energized. So you know, as we increase mileage, we really want to be thinking about how we have to shift our plate as well. Um, and I know that we talked about that in one of our episodes. Gosh, I don't know what episode number it was, but it was one of the more recent ones. So definitely check that episode out too for, for adjusting nutrition. Yeah. And even thank you for mentioning that because what I'll do guys is in the um, show notes as well. I'm going to drop a link where you can get all of Brooks episodes. I have it all on one page where you can get all seven of them. Um, so you can go back and listen, uh, to those. But I think, um, what do I want to mention about? Well, obviously the carbs, right? Like, um, some people might be a little scared of them, but you mentioned they kind of give us in, um, energy. And as we like to say here, uh, carbs give us spark and Brooke and I are both, uh, have our carbs give us spark shirts on. You got the t-shirt, I got the hoodie on at the time of this recording. Uh, but it is so important. And from what you mentioned about the fueling before a workout, when you said workout, um, do you mean like any run or any strength training session? Like you want to fuel before, during, and after, or yeah. is it only like fast running or only an intense workout or run? Yeah. Great question. So I, you know, rule of thumb, I just say, keep it simple. Anytime you are going to be exerting your body, um, getting that heart rate up, strength training or running, have something pre pre workout post work workout and then depending on the timing potentially during workout too, um, but pre workout carbohydrates are going to be useful for both strength training and for running. 
Um, and you know, some people will say, well, is there a certain amount of time that I should like try to, if I'm running less than 30 minutes, do I really need fuel? Um, I say, yes, I really do think you do. And so if, if let's say you're a morning runner, you don't have to have like a full breakfast meal before you head out, especially if it's just like a shorter training run. Um, but something small is going to be so helpful, whether that's like a banana or maybe a couple of graham crackers. If you're on Instagram, pop tarts are a really big thing on Instagram for pre-running fuel. Um, I'm not a huge pop tart fan. I just don't like the taste, but you know, my go-to pre-workout is like a banana or like half a bagel, something really, really simple. The reason we want simple carbohydrates is because It doesn't sit in our bellies like a rock, like something like a, you know, a protein or a fat would. So we want fast digesting food. We want food that's going to go right into our bloodstream to raise that blood glucose so that we can use it um, as we are running and as we are, you know, exerting our bodies. So simple carbohydrates before any sort of strength session or running session is going to be really, really helpful. Um, Let's say you're an afternoon runner, you're an after work or evening runner. If you've had a meal two or two to three hours before, you may or may not need a pre-workout snack. And this is where that individuality comes into play. And so, you know, anything that we say on this podcast is like general nutrition advice. Of course, if you have more specific questions, we can work more closely. Um, But let's say you had a meal two or three hours before, you might not need a pre-workout snack. Um, But if it's been longer than that three to four hours, then maybe you might want a little bit of a a carbohydrate boost before you head out on your run. So the timing is, is important trying to get too caught up in the weeds of it. But, you know, again, if it's been longer than three hours, you're probably going to want to have something a little, a little something before you head out. And timing of that should be 30 to 60 minutes before you head out on your run. All right. That's perfect. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, the, the graham crackers have been my, my new staple. Um, but I do a little combo. So I'll do a couple of graham crackers. I'll do one medjool date. And sometimes like for my, my long run that this morning, I did a banana. I did one medjool date and then I did like two full graham crackers and I put a little almond butter on it. And uh-huh. I know a lot of runners do like peanut butter on like toast or a bagel. Does that help at all? And I've been doing like the almond butter, um, not like too much, but does that help the carbs absorb if I do add a little bit of protein and and healthy fats? So the the reason to do something like an almond butter or peanut butter, honestly, is purely just for the taste pre-workout. It's not necessarily going to help the carbohydrates um, digest faster. It's actually going to slow down the digestion of the carbohydrate. So you know, if somebody wants to do the peanut butter, or almond butter, I just say go light on it because um, it could slow down that digestion. And then that's when you could cause something like GI upset or, you know, just that kind of like solid feeling in your stomach, like there's a rock sitting in it. Some people have that, some people don't, which again is where we get into the individualized nutrition piece. Um, so you got to know your body best, but um, yeah, whatever works for you. All right. Well, I'm glad I asked that question. And yeah, thank you for that reminder. Sometimes I get get a little heavy handed on the uh, almond (laughs) butter there. So now that I know that it's not actually enhancing any digestion, if anything, I go, if I go a little too much, it's going to slow down. I'll make sure I keep it super light. And it's really the measure date. I could have graham crackers all day, like by themselves. They're just delicious. Um, And they're just delicious. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So any other training tips um, before we get into the half marathon race itself? No, I think that's really, I think we covered the basics. Yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a good amount there. So, um, so now let's go to the half marathon itself. At the time of this recording, it's in March and we're heading into half marathon season, spring half marathons. There's a couple at the end of March. Um, I know New York City uh, half is actually this weekend, um, which will be the weekend before this uh, comes out on the pod. But um, April, there's a lot of half marathons. So it's like everyone's getting ready for the race. And I figured this would be good to really cover um, because we always get questions from runners of like, you know, what should I, you know, do before my half marathon race? So yeah, what do you say to that? Like before the race itself. Yeah, before the race itself. So first off, nothing new on race day. So everything that you have done up until race day should be nothing new to you. It should be like, I've practiced this. I know this. I know my routine. I've got it down. Um, However, the day of the race, I know sometimes timing isn't always going to be like what you were doing during practice or during training. So the day of the race, two to three hours before your race time, get up. Have yourself a carbohydrate-heavy breakfast, 
Maybe you include a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, but the majority of that meal should be carbohydrate based. So something like a big bowl of oatmeal, maybe it's a bagel, uh, maybe it's a couple of pieces of toast with a piece of fruit and like a glass of juice, you know, something that's carbohydrate heavy two to three hours before. And the timing of that, again, depends on how your stomach handles things. Pre-race jitters might be kicking in on the morning of your half marathon. So I say err on the side of caution. Give yourself plenty of time to digest that first meal. Um, so maybe you wake up three hours early to get your first meal in. And I know that that's going to be pretty early for some of you, like 4 or 5 a.m. I know. <laughs> but that's the, that's the uh, you know, the race day magic, I feel like, is you got to get up early and you've got to fuel yourself before you head out. So while you have your meal consider having a little bit of hydration as well. Eight to 16 ounces of water, depending on the um, temperature that day, you might include some electrolytes within your water. So something like a noon tablet or a you can or scratch, like add a serving of your electrolytes. And that's just going to help your body stay hydrated, retain that water a little bit better than just, you know, regular water without any electrolyte in it. Um, and then once you're heading out the door, you're getting ready, you're, you know, headed up to the start line 30 ish, 45 ish minutes before your race is when you might want to pop like a very simple carbohydrate, whether that's like, again, that graham cracker or a banana, um, maybe it's some like energy chews or a gel, uh, something very simple. That's just going to give your body a little bit of a top off, uh, before you head out and you do your hard effort. So the other thing I want to mention is that on race day, the idea is that you're going to be working a little bit harder than when you were during training sessions. So don't be surprised if your body is needing a little bit more carbohydrate um, during your run that day. So be prepared for that. Um, and I think we should probably like segue into that next, perhaps, um, of like what during during run, during race day, feeling before we do that, before we do that, if you don't mind. Um, so I think you, you brought up a lot of great points there. I heard two to three hours before mm -hmm. um, the race is when you want to have your meal, but then 30 minutes before we want to have like a carbohydrate that's going to fuel your body for the race and a simple carbohydrate ideally. So whether it's the graham crackers, banana, I know sometimes like I've even done like a you can bar. I think coach Lou has yep. done that before, or some people do their gel like right before they start, right? Like as opposed to waiting a couple miles. Um, and then can we just step back like one of course step before that actually like how about the week before a half marathon do i need to change anything in in how i eat like what should you or should you change anything in how you eat like the week before a half marathon so uh the golden answer it depends <laughs> but <laughs> some people like to do a carbohydrate load before their half marathon some people don't it truly just depends on what you want to do. A carbohydrate load can be helpful for some. A carbohydrate load for others is like, I don't really want to worry about it and stress about it. Um, if you have not practiced a carbohydrate load before your race, please don't do one because you just don't know how your body is going to react to them. It can just cause a lot of bloating and discomfort and potentially impact your race day. So if you have not practiced a carbohydrate load, I would suggest not doing one before your half marathon. If you have practiced a carbohydrate load before this race, um, potentially during this training session on a, on a previous long run, you know, what works well for you, you know, a one to two day prior, a, a 24 to 48 hour, like carbohydrate load before your race can be effective for a lot of people. Um, and so that would just mean increasing your carbohydrates a couple of days before the race, decreasing your protein and fat intake a little bit. Um, and that's really just to build up those glycogen stores and the glycogen stores is really what's going to propel you during your race, um, after that carbohydrate load. So the week before, you know, making sure that you're staying hydrated, of course, we're getting into spring and summer where we can just have really hot days. And so staying hydrated is super, super important. Maybe you want to do a little bit of extra electrolyte load that week. That's not going to hurt you at all. Um, so just some of those things. Any any clarifications that we should talk about there, Dwayne? 
Yeah, no, that was great. And I, I'm glad you brought up the electrolyte point because I was going to make that point because I know you mentioned that in a previous podcast. So for myself, even if the weather's not hot and I know I'm going half marathon, I'm going race effort, right? Like at the end of that race, it's a nine, a 10 out of 10 effort, right? Like the last mile, I'm leaving it all out there on the course. Um, like I plan to do this June for my half marathon. Um, yeah, I, I see no, right. There's, there's no harm in basically preloading with some electrolytes. So like having day before, two days before, and even the morning before, because I know you made that comment before, if it's hot, like obviously if it's hot, dew points high, you're going to be sweating a lot, then you probably even need more, right? But you can't, you can't go wrong with taking some electrolytes, right? Yeah, absolutely. And okay. especially if you're somebody that doesn't eat a lot of processed foods, which tends to be a lot of runners, um, your body is going to need that salt. So don't be afraid of, you know, having a little bit of extra sodium those, those couple of days leading up to the race. Yeah. And even for those that actually have low blood pressure, right? Um, this actually just happened to my daughter. Um, she had a little fainting incident. So a little, little scare. Um, yeah. But, you know, it turns out she does have really low blood pressure. So, you know, we're trying to get her to actually have more salt because, yeah, we usually don't, you know, have a lot of processed food. So just thinking about, you know, other runners who might have some low blood pressure, then they probably could even benefit from a little more as well. Um Absolutely. All right. Yeah. I think that definitely covers like the week before. Yeah. The whole carbo loading thing. Um, I know it was like, it seemed to be like a big movement and, you know, are you familiar with like the science on it and the literature? Like, does it even work? Like, do we know if it actually does in fact work if someone could even tolerate it? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, de- it is effective. And I can't remember the exact percentage, but I think it's somewhere between like five and 7%. It might even, it might not even be as high as 7%, but it, it can increase performance by th- some small percentage, which for some people is what they're looking for. If they're like, you know, they're 30 seconds away from breaking two hours or they're, you know, 30 seconds away from breaking that 90 minutes, that might be just a little bit of push that you need to get to your PR. Um, but it is a very small percentage. So if you're somebody that's like, I'm not really trying to like break, you know, a PR right now, or I'm just trying to do this casually. Like a carbo load is not going to make this like massive difference in your training. I think again, the, the, the moral of this story is that like, you're not going to cut minutes off your time by doing a carbohydrate load. It's just, if you're looking out to eke out that like last little bit of, um, you know, pure optimization in your training and your, in your, um, performance, that would be an appropriate time to do the carbohydrate load. Um, but I will say if you are somebody that is just not already consuming enough carbohydrates and then you do a carbohydrate load, it can almost be detrimental to your performance because you're going to feel a little bit more bloated. You're going to feel pretty heavy. Um, and it's, it's going to make your body just not feel great that day. So make sure that you've practiced beforehand and your day-to-day nutrition is optimized before you even consider a, a carbohydrate load. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from my understanding is a lot of those studies too are done in like pretty darn high doses, right? Of carbs. And Mm -hmm. I wonder, you probably don't know the answer to this, but I would imagine a lot of the subjects in those studies are probably younger. I would imagine, or military like cadets, right? Like they're younger and they're not in their forties and fifties. Yes. And that's always what I say about research is that you have to apply it to yourself and compare it to yourself. So is this person that's seeing all these results, is this person similar to me? If they're not, it's probably not applicable to you. And that's, we don't necessarily need to follow that, you know, recommendation because it just, it, it, it doesn't apply to you. Um, and that's like for anything, not just carbohydrate loading, but anything within nutrition, when we hear about the fasting and all that stuff is like, is this person an active person? Is this person, you know, similar in age to me? similar in, in gender to me, if not, well, that's probably not applicable to me. So that's why we hear a lot about nutrition research. Um, and what a lot of what I say goes against nutrition research. And that's just because a lot of it is not done in athletes. So I'm oftentimes recommending the opposite, um, of what, you know, the most popular research is saying. So. Right. Right. No, I think that's huge because I know a lot of our clients like who are thirties, forties, fifties, um, it seems like, and I've noticed myself, right? Like just digestion changes and like your GI system over these decades. And 
I remember when I tried a carbo load for a half marathon, I'll never forget that one. That was actually a virtual one. It was the first one after COVID that we did. We all did the virtual Delaware half marathon here in Connecticut um, with Coach Lou, Coach Kat, and uh, Coach Latoya. And yeah, Lou remembers because he was trying to like pace me and I bloating. I was like felt disgusting. It was terrible. I like totally couldn't even like finish the last two miles. It was like a jog. It was half marathon fail right like on epic proportions like it was like one of the worst half marathons the other one was when i had sunburnt feet when we went to the dominican republic and i didn't know there was sunburnt until i actually ran the half marathon and had like searing pain underneath both soles of my feet um but the delaware one the virtual delaware one even though they gave us a really cool medal um it was yeah not a great experience and i will never do that again and i've just found after running, I don't know, I think it's like 40 something half marathons I've done is just changing. And, you know, you've talked about this before and you kind of mentioned it quickly. And I think probably a lot of people just flew over their head, but just changing the proportions of someone's plate, not necessarily taking in all these extra calories than you would normally have, but you're just shifting the percentages and maybe having a little less fat, having less protein. Cause like I do have a lot of protein. Like I try to, you know, support muscle development, all that. And, um, you know, I will have a little less protein, but I'm adding more carbs and then just shifting the types of carbs as well to more of the easily digestible ones and staying away from, you know, the, the vegetables, the raw vegetables that are hard to digest or high fiber foods or the wheat products and breads and rice and all that stuff, um, to just things that are going to digest quickly. Um, and I found that like super, helpful. And so it's not like a true carbo load. I almost call it like a carb shift, right? You're just shifting it just a little bit and not too much because I feel like when you get, you know, too much and drastic, then your GI system is like, what the heck is going on? And even in the beginning, I remember, you know, and I think it's like tradition, right? Like you, you'll get even a local 5k and they'll do like a pasta dinner the night before because they just want to get everyone together, like community event. But it's like, number one, you know, you don't need a carbo load for a 5K. Um, And then number two, it's like, if you're not used to having like a big bowl of pasta, and now, you know, the next morning, you're just going to feel gross. Like you're not going to feel like you can actually perform well for that 5K. It's like the episode of The Office. Gosh, Joanne, I don't know if you're going to know this episode. I know. (laughs) Michael Scott. So they run like a 5K and he's eating fettuccine pasta like as as they're running the 5k and he <laughs> just feels like total dump and it's like yeah this is what we don't want to do <laughs> right right <laughs> um, i know was that the same episode with the bloody nipples because yeah. people have told me about that i haven't seen that episode yet but <laughs> just watch it just just to know it's like 20 minutes you, you just got to know what what the reference is it's so funny right um, oh my yeah, gosh you don't want to do anything different on race day don't don't be like michael scott <laughs> yes. All right. So I think we covered kind of week before the morning of the race and then right before the race. So now the race starts. We're getting in hopefully a nice little rhythm breathing wise. Um, and, you know, you're you're starting with a conservative start and following a good race day strategy. Um, so now how do we or how should we really fuel during the half marathon? Yeah. So, again, this should be something that's practiced way before race day. But if you uh, are planning on your half marathon taking longer than an hour, which should be everybody, (laughs) uh, that we need to be thinking about what we're going to feel with during your half marathon. And I don't care if you're running a three hour half marathon or you're running, you know, a a 90 minute half marathon, everybody needs to be fueling. It does not matter what your skill level is, how fast you are, how slow you are, um, how new you are to to running. This is something for everybody. um, Regardless. But Brooke, I've run two half marathons and I didn't need to eat anything. If just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's Saying that favorite, facetiously. That's my favorite saying. Um, <laughs> you don't know what you're missing out on. I promise you, even if you feel fine, what if you felt great? What if you crossed your half marathon finish line? And you're like, oh my gosh, I could keep going. Like I really have heard that from people who have properly trained and who have properly trained their gut to make, to be able to feel during, they're like, I didn't know it was possible to feel this good during my half marathon. I didn't hit that wall at mile 10. Um, I wasn't, you know, suffering the last couple of miles. So it really, really can make the biggest difference and get you, 
the extra oomph to the finish. So um, doesn't mean, again, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Um, so anything over like that hour mark, we want to be thinking about fueling. And I'm just talking about the length of the time. We actually want to fuel early during our half marathon. Um, and by early, I mean within the first 20 to 30 minutes, you should be thinking about fueling, even if you're not hungry. If you are waiting until you're hungry to eat, it's far too late and it's going to be really, really hard to catch up. And that includes both hydration and fuel and food. So like your carbohydrates and we want to be having carbohydrates primarily during that half marathon. We don't need to be incorporating any sort of protein, any sort of fat. It's just going to be purely carbohydrates. Um, and you don't have to worry about like crazy blood sugar spikes or anything like that because your body is actually using that carbohydrate immediately. And we're seeing very small shifts in blood sugar. So I know that's like a really big thing right now too, out on the interwebs is like, don't spike your blood sugar and don't eat carbs because it's going to spike your blood sugar. Um, your body utilizes carbohydrates very, very differently when you are exercising. So just wanted to include that little tidbit in there too. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I think it's, you know, one of those misconceptions as well, besides the fact that like, hey, I didn't need to eat anything for a half marathon in the past um, is, well, I'm not hungry, right? Like nobody is going to be hungry running a half marathon race. Like, I don't think that's like possible, right? Because literally your blood flow is being shunted away from your GI system and is going to your muscles. And it's just trying to like maintain whatever pace that you're doing and the effort level, like no one's going to be hungry. So don't go by hunger cues. And even if you, and then thirst cues, I'm sure we can get into that, right? Like if you're thirsty, like you waited way too long, <laughs> right. To start actually hydrating. Um, so I think that's such an important point because a lot of times when I go over with my clients, like their race day strategy and when they're going to be fueling, you know, they're like, really, you want me at, you know, mile three to like take a gel? Like, I'm not going to need a gel. Yeah, you won't, but you have to get ahead of it now to prevent, you know, so you, you stay ahead of it. So you always have fuel in the tank, right? That you can use when you want to use it. And this is going to help you at mile 10, 11, and 12, if you're actually taking it, you know, this early in the race. Yeah. So I think that's like a misconception where people wait till that hour mark. And I think they've been told that, right? Like, oh, if you're running less than an hour, you don't need to fuel it. You just use your glycogen stores and you're like good to go. You have enough on board. Your body's not going to like collapse. Um, so people like, I think, have that misconception of, oh, I don't need to start fueling until that hour mark. So I'm not fueling until mile seven, eight, nine, ten of like a half marathon. And they take like one gel. Or like the courses too, they'll like give away one gel at one point. So everyone thinks, oh, that's when I'm supposed to have my gel when the course, you know, is giving me a gel at whatever mile eight or nine. hundred percent. And I'm glad that you brought up like the shunting uh, from the gut to our muscles. That is why, like, that is precisely why I recommend and most dietitians will recommend to fuel early and fuel often is to keep the blood flow going through your gut. So oftentimes mm -hmm. if you are somebody that's like, well, I can't fuel because I have GI distress, um, it's because you've waited too long. In most circumstances, it's either you're dehydrated or you waited too long to have carbs and your your gut is, is that blood flow is just not there. And so you're putting something in your gut and that's when you might have that like quote unquote dumping syndrome effect where you get diarrhea or you get that major cramping because um, the, the carbohydrate is just sitting in your gut and it feels terrible or your, your gut then dumps it and then you have like a diarrhea effect. So that's like precisely why we want to start fueling early and fueling often um, is to prevent all of that blood flow from going to our muscles and keeping it in our gut. Um, so that's, that's the important piece there. That makes so much sense. I never thought about it from like that lens of you're actually keeping the GI system stimulated to send some blood flow there. I, I like that. That's really, really good. And yeah, these are all like the mistakes I made in the beginning of my half marathon journey, honestly. And so hopefully for those that are listening, like we're just preventing you from making the same mistakes, right? That like I made um, early in my half marathon journey. All right. Besides, uh, or I guess maybe we'll close that loop with hydration. Anything you want to mention in terms of hydration during the half marathon? So same thing, fuel or start early. 
Um, you know, start early, start often. I honestly, a lot of my clients start even earlier than when they might fuel like with a gel. So within like the first mile, they're taking small sips. If you're somebody that, you know, you have a sensitive gut, um, you know, smaller sips is going to be more effective for you than taking large doses of water at once. So I always like to have my own liquids with me just because I don't like to rely on the aid stations because you don't know what they're going to have, whether it's something that you know you're going to like, you don't know if they're going to have just water or a mix. Um, the one thing I will say that I always mention when I talk on podcasts is you don't know how they are concentrating their liquids and their beverages. If it's a bigger race, like, you know, Boston or something like that, like I'd hope that they're properly concentrating their water, but for smaller, more local races, they might not be. And I know this from experience. This is something I learned when I, uh, when I was working at a marathon tent, uh, they're like, make sure you're like over diluting the water. Like we want to conserve the electrolyte powder. So we were giving out like, very lightly flavored water. Um, you weren't getting a whole ton of like a whole bunch of electrolytes. So that's why I like to say use your own products if you can, like if you can wear a belt or wear a vest. Um, I'm also not a huge fan of bladders. Like I like the collapsible pouches instead that you can put in the front so that you can keep track of how much water you're drinking. Um, those are like my biggest, my biggest tips for, for water intake. Um, and and then apparently, you know, if I could okay. just jump in there with the flasks in the front, that's what I use. And I learned actually um, at our PT conference from a biomechanical standpoint, um, it is better to have uh, the weight in the front versus the back um, in terms of like posture and like breathing wise and just opening up um, the diaphragm. So yeah, yeah, I use the flasks in the front, but it makes sense where you can, you know, have a little better idea of how much you did uh, drink. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's, that's why. I, and I like to have the extra room in my back pocket where the bladder would be anyway for like extra fuel or, you know, not that you'd be stopping to like change your socks in a half marathon. You might be, but um, like just any, any sort of extras that you might need in that, in that back pocket. So. Okay. And if someone was like a numbers person, and I don't know, even know if you do this, do you wind up uh, like counting calories at all? Like, is there a certain number of like calories you should eat during a half marathon? I do. I like to do carb counts instead, um, because the the research within the the running research is all carbohydrate based, and we've actually compared like the carbohydrate versus the calorie intake, and making sure that you have the carbohydrate number is a lot more effective for performance than than a calorie amount. And you might see different dietitians using like calorie amounts versus carbohydrates. I prefer to use the carbohydrates. I think it's a lot easier. One and two clients have had more success with using the carb base versus like the calorie base. So if your half marathon is going to be less than two hours, we want to aim for 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Um, and if you're going to, you're planning on your, your half marathon taking longer than two hours, we want to shoot for a 60 to 90 gram of carbohydrate intake per hour. Um, and again, that's based on research of the length of time needed and how much our body is using. And this is not dependent on weight. You might have noticed that I didn't say based on weight. It's actually based on time. Um, and everybody's body is is going to be more effective by using that carbohydrate level of 30 to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. And that's from both your hydration and from your, your gels. So you can combine those two things to get up to that 30 to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Yeah. And what would you say the average gel has for carbohydrates? Oh my gosh. There's, it's like such a boom right now with what, what we have on the market. Um, if you're using something like a Huma or a Yukan or a like cliff block, a, a goo, those are going to be anywhere from like 17 to 21 ish grams of carb. Um, there's also other products out there like Martin or spring energy gels. Um, gosh, there's so many others. Those are the first two that come to mind that are going to have anywhere from like 25 all the way up to 45 grams of carb. So being on the lookout for what so those are a little higher. Yeah. Those are going to be higher and it truly look at the back of the package. Cause there's so many different products out there now. Like I feel like before we didn't have anything that was really higher than 25 grams of carb. And now we have things that are much, much higher because uh, people are caring more about their nutrition, which is awesome. Yeah. And I think that's important to know because so many runners just go into the mindset of like, Hey, I'm going to have one gel during my half marathon race. Cause I've always done it, or I'm going to have two gels 
during my half marathon race. And I just actually had a call with uh, my client who's running New York City half uh, this weekend. Um, and she's like, I've never had three gels during a half marathon. I'm like, I know, but now you will, <laughs> right? Like, um, I'm like, three gels is the minimum I have, you know, for a half marathon. So just making sure you know your carb count, I think is important. And then thinking about the time duration. I, I'm glad that you brought that up too, that it doesn't matter the person's body weight. Um, it's more dependent upon the time and how long they're going to actually be running. And yeah, if your gel only has 20 carbs or less than that, like do the math guys. Like if research is telling us like, okay, we'll go in the middle. There are 60 grams, right? Of carbs mm -hmm. per hour. That's literally three gels an hour. Yep. So if you're doing a two hour half marathon, technically you should be having six gels, right? For performance wise. And I think, you know, the more that I've, you know, been learning and hearing from others and um, even seeing like, obviously we can't compare ourselves to the professionals, but, um, you know, there, it seems like everyone is fueling more. Like we're, we're kind of understanding that yes, fuel matters. And even for my last two marathons, I did a total of seven gels for each of them. And the one that I did dopey, it was like, I felt like, I needed it at the end. Um, so, but I, I think to your point before, you got to practice with the training. And if you're listening to this right now and your half marathon race is next week or two weeks, like don't go crazy with, you know, like, oh, Brooke said, you know, 60, 90 carbs. And you just try to like down six gels and you've literally been fueling your long runs with one gel. Like your body is not going to be happy with you. Like it does take time to train your gut to be able to actually digest food while you're actually exerting yourself and running and you're having your heart rate that's elevated. So, you know, it does take time and you, you have to practice this stuff um, in training. And I'll repeat it because I hear it all the time. You know, someone finds, oh, I saw this post. I saw this blog article. Should I take this for my race? Or, you know, they're in the, uh, you know, the exhibit hall or, um, you know, I saw this product that's supposed to be the best thing to fuel your race. Like, have you tried it during a long run? <laughs> if the answer is no, you're not going to try it on race day, right? So Absolutely. yeah, nothing new on race day. So I felt like that uh, is definitely important to reiterate there. So now, hey, we finished the half marathon. So that means like, that's it, right? That's all I need to worry about. I cross the finish line, get my medal, see what my time is, take my selfies, right? You're like celebrating, and that's it, right? I don't need to eat anything because I'm not performing anymore, right? Like, yeah, do we need might, to eat anything after like a half marathon? Feel, yeah, you might not be hungry. You might not feel like you want to eat anything. Um, and that's because, again, like when you're running, your body shuts down hunger and fullness cues because <laughs> whether we like it or not, our body thinks that we are in danger when we are running. So things, accessory things that aren't necessary for um, like survival, i.e. Uh, hunger and fullness cues get totally shut down. Um, so you may not feel hungry after a race. However, I will have some athletes tell me when they start fueling better, they actually do have an appetite after they race because their body, like that gut was still stimulated during the race. So they, they actually are hungry, um, dependent on the person. But if you're somebody that's not super hungry after a race, let's try to do like some sort of carbohydrate protein beverage. Um, liquids can oftentimes be well, better tolerated, well tolerated at, after a race rather than solids. Um, but you want to focus on getting yourself some sort of carbohydrate rich food and protein rich food. Um, carbohydrates being the primary, the primary source of energy that we want after a run. Cause again, that glycogen is going to be depleted, especially after half marathon. We're at that length where our body is using up most of our glycogen stores. Um, so we want to be able to replace what is lost. And again, give our body that energy with the carbohydrate protein is important as well. So protein is going to obviously help with muscle growth, muscle repair, recovery, soreness levels the next day, two days, three days out, we shouldn't be like feeling like we're gonna, you know, can't walk up and down the stairs three days after a half marathon because we didn't have enough fuel. Um, so all of these things can really, really help with recovery. And the reason we want both that carbohydrate and protein is so that protein can do its job of muscle repair um, and carbohydrates can do its job of re energy replenishment. If we only focus on protein, which is like a popular thing, I feel like we always hear protein, protein, protein post-workout. Um, if we only focus on protein, 
our body is always going to prioritize prioritize energy production first. So protein isn't actually being used for muscle repair and muscle recovery. It's being used for energy first. Whatever is left over is then going to muscle repair. So carbohydrates and protein together is really important. I love it. I love it. So the key there is the big difference after the race, you need protein, but you got to do it with the carbs, as Brooke mentioned. And try the liquids if because most people, yes, you're are not hungry, especially right after, like within the first half hour, hour of the race, usually you're not hungry. And yeah, that's where I will bring my like protein drink and have something that's easily digestible. Banana, you know, after the race is like great. Um, and you have to get in the fuel, even if you're not hungry. It's just so important to really stimulate the next bucket that we talk about in our six steps to growing as a runner is the recovery process. And, you know, not even from just how you feel standpoint, um, you know, you want to be able to celebrate like how your body feels the next day and like delayed onset muscle soreness, but even like fatigue level later that day, like you want to be able to celebrate your win, like with your family, with your friends, right? Like you want to feel like a normal person and not like, you know, you're zonked the rest of the day. Um, so getting that nutrition in, I think really, really helps and, and being consistent with it too. If you have something smaller after the race, cause they don't have like a meal there, then you got to make sure, Hey, within an hour or two, like you actually have to have a meal, right? You, you need to replenish everything that you've actually, you know, spent out on the course. Yeah. And this is, this is where I kind of bring in that, that person that might say, well, I haven't fueled before and I've been fine. I always ask like, how are you doing a couple hours after where you like totally laid up on the couch? You couldn't play with your kids that day. Cause you had to sleep and you just like, you had a massive pounding headache. Um, how did you feel the next day where you told again, totally laid up because you were so sore and you had no energy. You felt kind of sick to your stomach. That's a really good indicator that, um, nutrition again, assuming that your training was on point, that nutrition was not prioritized and it could be optimized and you could play with your kids after your half marathon, or you could go out and do, you know, other activities with your significant other, or just having the energy to do life after your half marathon. Um, we shouldn't, you know, be feeling so bad after our longer efforts, after our race efforts that we like can't engage in like regular life activities. So that's really the, one of the biggest differences I would say athletes have is they're like, wow, my headache wasn't there. I had energy. Like, this is great. Um, So it's not just that during effort that we're looking for, like looking for that increased performance. It's also when the running is done too, that we're looking for that, that extra oomph again. Yeah. And that's been huge for me too, because even like summer, hot, sweaty, long runs, I would always have that headache that you mentioned, but really prioritizing as soon as I get home, like having quick fuel, both protein, carbs, having water, having electrolytes again, um, even though I was using electrolytes during the run itself. And then having that meal, it like literally takes care of it where, you know, I can record podcast episodes after my long runs now and not feel like I'm drained. Um, So yeah, no, that's super helpful. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So much goodness here, Brooke. And if you're a runner out there who's just looking, you're like, Hey, these tips are like great. Um, but you feel like, you know what, I don't know if this is going to work for me. And you want a little bit more individualized, like nutrition plan and you want to prevent under fueling. So you can run that half marathon without hitting the wall. Then you can begin to work with Brooke with our one-on-one signature coaching program. This is an actual add on feature to our coaching program, uh, that we've just started. And it really includes three one-on-one nutrition sessions with Brooke, um, including, the specific fueling based guidance uh, based on food log, meal pattern education, and access to her Nutrition for Runners course, as well as snack and meal plan guides, pre, post, and during running fuel guidance. Um, remember, guys, I always get this misconception like coaching is not just for quote unquote fast runners, right? Yes. Um, so, if you're an average runner, just like I am, and you're just looking to like continue to improve and continue to feel good um, and, you know, challenge yourself at races, go ahead, schedule your strategy call with me today and you can grab one of our remaining slots uh, to conquer your half marathon race goals, whatever they may be. You can simply schedule your call on my calendar just by going to learn.sparkhealthyrunner.com forward slash coaching. Brooke, as always, 
This has been wonderful. You're a wealth of knowledge. I learn something every time we talk. So I just uh, love what you have to share. So I appreciate you educating our community about half marathon nutrition. Thanks for having me, Dwayne. It's always, always, always a pleasure. Yeah. And thank you to the listener for you guys. If you weren't listening, then we wouldn't be doing this. So you guys are listening. Uh, so we appreciate you. And whether you're listening during a run, you're like driving in the car, or maybe you're watching the video version on the Spark Healthy Runner YouTube channel. I appreciate all of you. And if you like this training, then you'll surely like the next. So if you're listening on the podcast, queue up episode 182 to learn all about how to choose your long run fuel with Brooke, or just click the video I have for you here if you're watching on YouTube. As always, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and let's just keep on running. Until next time.